So what's on the agenda for today? So we're going to briefly cover what Rancher is. So this webinar won't dive too much into the Rancher product itself. Instead, we're going to show you how Rancher and Octopus can be used together to deploy applications to your Kubernetes cluster. Likewise, this isn't a getting started webinar. So we're assuming there's going to be some familiarity with some of the core Octopus concepts. And then once we've talked a little bit about Rancher, I'll be handing the reins to Sean, where he'll demonstrate how you can create a Kubernetes cluster in GKE. That's the Google Kubernetes engine in the Google Cloud. That's a bit of a mouthful. All managed through the Rancher web portal. He'll then continue to walk you through adding the newly created GKE cluster into Octopus Deploy as a Kubernetes deployment target. And then hot off the heels of that, Sean will then go on to show us how you can deploy a containerized version of the Java Pet Linux application to the Rancher Managed Cluster. And then lastly, at the end of the webinar, we'll take any questions you've asked and we'll do our very best to answer them for you. Okay, so first up, what is Rancher? Now, Sean, I'm not as well versed with all of the Kubernetes commands uh, you can use to manage a cluster, but I know you have more experience in, in this space. So if you're managing multiple clusters, I imagine you know, using multiple screens or tabs to manage clusters using the command line must become a bit tedious. Uh, definitely. Uh, using the, uh, the, the command line interface, sometimes you have to make sure you have the right uh, cube config file loaded so that you're interfacing with the correct cluster and managing that can be kind of a pain in the butt. I've never tried actually adding all of the clusters into a single one. I'm not sure if you can, but, uh, but yeah, it, having something like Rancher just makes it so much easier. Yeah, exactly. And this is one of the problems that Rancher helps with. You know, it's a Kubernetes management platform and that allows you to manage multiple clusters in a single place. Um, another thing to note is that Rancher itself is also quite unique in that it can be run from anywhere that Docker is installed. That's because the platform itself runs in a container. And this is nice because it makes its footprint nice and lightweight. Rancher also allows you to manage both on-premise and Kubernetes clusters hosted in the cloud. And this cloud support includes both cloud providers directly, so things like Amazon EC2, Azure Virtual Machines, DigitalOcean, as well as their managed Kubernetes services, so such as EKS on Amazon, AKS on Azure, and GKE, uh, which we'll demo later. Question for you, Sean. Um, have you worked with any customers that have had to manage clusters that are both on-premise and in the cloud? I have. Uh, I worked with a customer that was using um, Ubuntu clusters locally on their local data center for development and test, but their staging and production clusters were all hosted in Azure. And using the Rancher system, it allowed them to have the single place to manage both. Exactly. You know, having that single pane to manage all your uh, clusters with Rancher, it allows you to centralize things such as authentication and access control. And same goes for communication as well. Instead of connecting to each of the Kubernetes individual API endpoints, you can effectively proxy communication to your clusters through Rancher. And we'll show this later when we connect up Octopus to this GKE cluster. Um, Sean, given that you, you, know, you can proxy communication through Rancher, how does that work with Octopus? Is there a specific, specific deployment target you use in Octopus to connect it up? Nope, according to Octopus Deploy, it's, it's just a, a Kubernetes deployment target. It doesn't know that it's a Rancher one. All right, cool. And lastly, the, the other benefit we should mention really is that you can monitor your clusters from that one unified place as well. So like in the case of that customer, both Ubuntu um, self-hosted and then uh, in Azure, I think you said, was it? Correct. Yeah. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to you, Sean, for the demo. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, for those of you who have never seen Rancher before, this is the interface that you're presented with when, when you first log in. The latest versions of Rancher come with a K3 cluster built into the container itself. This is the, the barest form of Kubernetes that you can have. It's this, like the, essentially a stripped down version and it doesn't have a whole lot of horsepower. So we're not gonna be using that one today. Uh, as, as Mark mentioned, I'm gonna be creating one in GKE. So to create a cluster, you simply click on add cluster and you're given a different, all the different options. Uh, we're gonna be choosing Google, Google GKE. And one thing that I did ahead of time for this webinar is to create the service account on uh, Google that has the necessary permissions to create uh, clusters. So I'm gonna give this uh, cluster a name, just call it Pet Clinic. Um, when you do create that uh, service account, it gives you a JSON file 
that you can load here that will uh, connect to GKE and give you the same options that you would get if you were on GKE itself, such as you know the different zones, what version of Kubernetes. Uh, for the most part, we're gonna be leaving all of these features as default uh, with the exception of this network one here uh, to keep things separate from our, our GKE or our Google account in, G in Google. I've created a separate network, so I'm going to switch over to that rancher one. Um, and then we're not going to do any IP aliasing, so I'm going to click on that. And now we're going to define all the different nodes and the options that we have for the nodes. I only need one for this demonstration, so I'm just going to do one here. And everything else on this form can, can be just default. So I'm going to click, click Create here. And it's already started to do the provisioning process on GKE. Now, if you were paying attention when I typed in the name for the cluster, I actually had capital P, capital C. Uh, for those of you who are, from, who are familiar with Kubernetes, it really likes everything lowercase. So Rancher just go ahead, went ahead and made that lowercase for me. Uh, if you've used Octopus Deploy, you're already aware that when you deploy to a VM that you use the tentacle. Now, a Kubernetes target is different in that a tentacle is not installed anywhere. It's just an API that we're deploying to, but we do need a way to authenticate to that API. So the first thing that we need to do is uh, create an account. So I'm gonna go up here and click on APIs and keys. I'm gonna click on add key give this a name and I'm going to limit the scope of this account specifically to the pet clinic cluster. So I click create here. It's important to note that when you do this, the secret key and the bearer token values, this will be the only time they're ever displayed. So you're going to want to make sure you keep those in a, in a safe place. So uh, we're going to be using the token method to connect to our cluster. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this. And then I'm going to go to Octopus Deploy to create that account. Account creation is located under Infrastructure and Accounts. And then Add Account and choose Token. I'm going to call this Pet Clinic Webinar. If I can spell correctly. And paste in that token value. And if you wanted to limit this particular account to a specific environment, you have that ability to choose the environment here. I'm just gonna let it be used for all of them. And then I'm gonna click save. And Sean, it's worth pointing out as well at this point. So in the same way that you mentioned that the, the token on the rancher screen would be that the only time you'd see it. Same goes for when, before you hit save there, that token is now um, saved encrypted in the database, right? That's correct. Uh, it's now in the database once you click that save button. And even if I wanted to, I can't retrieve it. Now, all I can do is either delete it or change it. So it's stored there. So that's something we, that we don't have to worry about. All right. So with our account created, we can go back to Rancher here, uh, close this window, and then go back to our pet clinic cluster. And it's still provisioning. So we can go over to Rancher and just have a look to see what's going on here. And we can see that this particular uh, cluster is still in the provisioning state. Now Rancher will create the cluster with this unique name to it, um, but it will give a label on it so you know which one it is if you happen to be in the backend interface. I did play around to see if I can get it to name it Pet Clinic itself. I wasn't able to figure out, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. So uh, what parts of Rancher did you play with, Mark? I'm curious. So I think I actually followed your blog post um, and uh, set it up locally. Uh, but I've got to be honest, I didn't get uh, much past the um, creation of Rancher. I didn't actually successfully deploy anything. Um, I got uh, dragged onto other things, as, as, as sometimes is the case. Um, but is there anything, like, is there one feature in Rancher that you'd say is, like, killer, is, is the thing that you really kind of uh, recommend to customers? Not one in particular. I just really like the whole experience. It just makes the, the management of the cluster so much easier than trying to do everything via the command line and stuff like that. Okay, so we can see that our, uh, create, our cluster is uh, finally done creating. 
we can go back to Rancher now. And it's in the waiting for the API to be available. It should just take a few seconds. And here we are. Our cluster is now uh, created. It's being communicated with. And so we're ready to uh, add this as a deployment target. So adding a deployment target to Octopus Deploy, we do need to know what the cluster's URL is. The quickest way to get that is to click on this kubeconfig file here. And within the kubeconfig file, we can see that this URL is the URL that we need. So we just click. Sean, sorry, is this, is, this the, is this the URL to the actual GKE cluster, or is this the proxying that we were talking about previously? This is actually the proxy one. That's a good point, Mark. So if we go back to here, so you see this IP address here. This is the IP address for Rancher itself. And if we go into the cluster and take a look at what the endpoint is, we can see that it's a completely different IP address. So this, this is definitely proxying through Rancher. Gotcha. Okay. So let's get this uh, connected as a deployment target. So let's go back to Octopus Deploy. And still within the infrastructure tab, we'll click on deployment targets and click add deployment target. Choose Kubernetes cluster and add. Go ahead and give this cluster a name. Oops. Uh, we need to choose an environment to work with. So we'll just choose the development environment. And we're going to give it a new role. Call it Pet Clinic Webinar. And make sure you hit enter because I can't tell you how many times I forgot to do that and then I had to do it all over again if it's a new role. All right. Uh, now comes the part where we tell it how we're authenticating against this uh, cluster. So uh, we, we chose token before, so we'll choose token here and the token that we created. This is where we add the, uh, the URL for the cluster. So do paste that there. Uh, we could have done a certificate uh, just for this demonstration. I've chosen not to, so I'm going to click on skip TLS verification. And I'm going to use a development namespace and click Save. We have an issue. Uh, if you recall earlier when I said that Kubernetes really likes everything in lowercase, Octopus Deploy will not fix it for you, but it will tell you that something's wrong. So I have to go back here, do development. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention, if you did want a specific worker pool to work with this cluster, you can choose it here. Otherwise, you can just leave it default. I'm going to leave it default. So click save. Okay, so we've added our cluster to Octopus Deploy. Uh, one of the first things that happens in Octopus Deploy when a new deployment target is added is it does a health check to make sure that it's functional. So if we click on tasks here, we can see that this task is queued behind. Oh, there it goes. All right. Click into here. Sure, what, what actually oh. happens um, on a health check for a Kubernetes target? It just makes sure that it can connect to the cluster with the, the authentication that you've chosen and verify connectivity. Gotcha. And here we go. Our cluster has been connected to. It's verified that we can connect to it. So we are now ready to create our project. So this is the part of the demonstration where I'm going to be deploying the pet clinic application. So I'm going to click on projects here. I'm going to have it show empty groups because I have a specific group for this one. And I'm going to add projects. Call it Pet Clinic Webinar. OK. So this Pet Clinic application uh, has a MySQL backend. So as part of our cluster for our Kubernetes application, I'm actually going to be creating all of the containers that are necessary to run it, including MySQL. So before we define our process, I do need to define some variables first so that I can use those when filling out the form for the process. So I'm gonna click on variables here and I'm gonna start creating some. So the first one we're gonna create is the variable for the JDBC connection string. And next one is going to be uh, the name for the deployment of MySQL. And this is 
specifically for the Kubernetes uh, deployment type. And I'm gonna add some, some variables here for the environment variables of the MySQL container. First one is the database we want it to create when the container spins up. Uh, MySQL does require a root password to be created. So I'm going to create that real quick. I'm gonna change the type to sensitive so that it's not just in plain text. So I'm gonna paste that here. Uh, you can see the little eyeball here. Uh, this is the only time that you'll be able to actually see it. So once I click save, it's going to be encrypted inside the database. So I didn't want to use the root uh, account to interact with our database for pet clinic. So I'm going to have MySQL create a different user account for this. Let's call that pet clinic user. So that account also needs a password. Make that sensitive as well. So that other pods can talk to it, we do need to create a cluster IP. And this is something that I'll be doing in a minute, but I do need to give the cluster IP a name. And this is gonna serve as kind of like the DNS entry for Kubernetes. All right, just a couple more to go. I'm working on the ones for the pet clinic application now. I need to give that deployment a name. Also gonna be creating an ingress for this application. So I'm gonna create a name for the ingress as well. And lastly, one more variable to create. I'm going to be creating a load balancer as well. And I'll, and I'll explain the reasoning while I have both a load balancer and an ingress controller. It's just a second. Uh, Sean, with the ingress name there, do you need a, another S on the end there? I don't know if it makes any difference. Uh, it, it, it didn't, but I appreciate you pointing out that I forgot to, to copy yeah, that. Right. So uh, these are all the variables that we need to create. So I'm going to click on save here. All right. With these variables created, we are now in a good spot to start creating our process. So I'm going to click on process, uh, click on add step, choose the Kubernetes category. And I'm going to use the deploy Kubernetes containers built-in step to Octopus Deploy. This is an opinionated form that you can fill out for a whole bunch of the different options available to Kubernetes. Call that deploy MySQL. We're going to... Uh, choose the target that we created earlier, or not target, but role, pet clinic webinar role. And I'm gonna, for this first time, I'm gonna kind of slowly scroll through some of this stuff so you can see the amount of things that are available for this. So uh, this one is gonna be a resource type of deployment. So we're gonna go ahead and choose the variable created for the deployment name. I'm only gonna have one of these. I don't for this demonstration, I don't need more than one MySQL uh, containers to be created. So I'll choose that. I'm not gonna do any labels. Uh, the deployment strategy is pretty important. Um, this rolling update deployments, Mark, I think you've actually used that one before, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. So one of the main benefits and probably why it's the default in Octopus is it avoids downtime. Uh, so what it will do is it will deploy your new pods um, before removing the older pods. So once they're fully up online and traffic is is slowly migrated over, um, then it will de deploy. It will destroy. Sorry, the older pod. So it's definitely a firm favorite of mine. Oh yeah, that that makes a lot of sense as to why it's default. Then, cool. I'm just going to leave that the way it is. Then, um, we can create volume mounts, and when when normally when you would do a database container, you would have it to where the data is stored on a volume mount because once the database is created or destroyed, or the containers destroyed, my apologies, uh, the data would go with it unless you did that. For this demonstration, we're not gonna worry about doing a volume app, uh, but we do need to define the container. So I'm gonna click on add container. Give this a name, call it MySQL. One thing that I did do ahead of this webinar was create an external feed to Docker Hub so that we can find the Docker images. So just tell MySQL. Um, since we're using Docker Hub and we're not using any credentials to 
authenticate to it. Uh, we can go ahead and skip this section here. We don't need to worry about it, but we do need this container to expose the port so that it can be uh, referred to. So we'll call this MySQL. Uh, port 3306 is the default port and TCP protocol. Excuse me. Again, you can define volume mounts for the container specifically. Um, I, I'm going to slowly scroll through some of this so you can see all the different options you have just for the container section alone. Uh, I do need to create some uh, create some environment variables, so I'm going to go ahead and do that while we're here. Click on Add Environment Variable. And the first one is going to be the password that we created for the user for the user account that we wanted. So that's the user password one. Next one is the initial database we want the container to create when it spins up. Next is the user account name that we want it created. And lastly is that uh, root password that is required. Okay, so those are the environment variables that we need for the MySQL container. So as you can see, you can do secrets, config maps, liveness probes. There's just a whole lot of options that you have without having to know any YAML for this. So just kind of scroll through this a little bit. This will be the only time I'm gonna do this. I'm not gonna do this for every one of them. Well, that is a lot. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of stuff. So uh, we're done with this container, so I'm gonna click okay. All right, so we've created our database and it's gonna create an empty database for us. So, but the, but the pet clinic application needs a schema and some database to work with. So I'm gonna have it run a container that will populate that. Now, if you're familiar with containers, typically they're designed to run and keep running depending on how you have your restart policy set. The type of operation that they need to do is known as a Kubernetes job because a job allows the container to start and stop. That's what it's designed to do. If we click on the Kubernetes category, you can see we don't have a specific step for job, but we do have a raw YAML step so we can define the YAML ourselves. So I'm gonna click on deploy a, a Kubernetes YAML I'm gonna call it run flyway because it's using the flyway container in the background. Choose the role. And this gives us the option to either paste the YAML directly into this, uh, this step or reference a package and have the YAML be in a file in the package. I'm gonna go ahead and paste it directly. Copy this here. All right. You can see that I've told it that it's a job uh, and I've told it what container to use, the commands, and then I passed in some environment variables. And Sean, are there any other use cases you'd recommend when you want to use this uh, raw YAML step? Yes. Um, the Opinionated form is pretty thorough in all the options that it gives you, but it, it doesn't handle every situation that you can encounter. So for those unique circumstances where you need things to be tweaked in a very specific way, you can use this step to uh, define exactly how you want it so that you don't have to worry about that for it. Yeah, no, it's, it's kind of like the, the get out of jail free card. Like if the, if the opinionated step doesn't have one of those properties, even though it does have so many, like you can use this to, um, this step as a, as a way to uh, deploy the YAML that you want. Exactly. So I'm gonna click on done here. And uh, we are actually done with the step, so we don't need to do any more. So I'm gonna click on add step for the next one. And we're gonna be using, we're gonna be deploying the pet clinic application proper now. So use the form again.
And Sean, just while you're um, typing that name, I noticed you haven't hit save yet in the editor here. Um, is that like a, a change to the processor in a recent version of Octopus? Yeah, that was uh, one of the things that the customer feedback had given us is that having to save can be quite painful every time you create a new step or edit a step. There have been times when I've had a relatively lengthy deployment process and I needed to, I, I'd forgotten what I'd put in another step and I had to go back, but I wasn't done filling out the step yet and I couldn't save without filling out the rest of it, but I didn't know what it was. So I ended up having to discard the changes, go back, figure out what it was, and then start all over again. That's not a very pleasant user experience. So they've enhanced the, uh, the interface to allow you to be able to jump between steps without having to save first, which is nice. a huge time saver. Yeah, absolutely. This means that work that you've uh, you know, input is not about, you don't have to worry about saving it, therefore losing that um, based on validation that's um, foreign, yeah. Yeah, I found myself, what I would do is I'd actually open up a second window so that I could go back and forth without having to save, but that still not incredibly efficient either. Yeah. So, all right, we're gonna go ahead and finish filling out this step here. Uh, we're going to choose the uh, the role that we've uh, going to be deploying against that clinic webinar. Go. It is a deployment type. We're going to give our deployment a name. I only want one replica. So we're going to go down to the container section and give it a name. And the containerized version is available on Docker Hub publicly. So if I just paste that in there, it should find it. There we go. Again, we're not going to worry about this. Uh, this container does use uh, Tomcat. So uh, the default port is 8080. So we need to expose that port. Not doing any of that, but I do need a couple of environment variables. So I'm gonna go to that section real quick. Uh, the first one is the password for the user account that we're gonna be connecting to the database with. Then the username. Oops, not that one, there we go. And lastly, the JDBC connection string, which is defined as the environment variable of URL. All right. Uh, everything else we can leave default inside this container section. So I'm just going to click OK. Right, and then scroll down to the services section. All right. Um, earlier, I had mentioned that I was going to, you know, tell you the reasoning I have a load balancer and an ingress. Um, GKE specifically didn't like doing an ingress without a lo load balancer behind it. So that's the biggest reason I had to create both. So we need to give our service a name, which is going to be the load balancer name, and tell it that it is specifically a load balancer type. So click on this one. Uh, when choosing load balancer, the load balancer IP address input box will come up. When running locally, this is something you probably have to enter. But for cloud services such as uh, Azure, AWS, or Google, uh, you don't need to actually fill in this value. They're, they're going to do that for you when the resource is created. So I can just leave this blank. Do need to add a service ports. The 80 and target port is the HTTP port and click OK. And we are done with this step. I am going to go back to the MySQL steps. I think I might have forgotten the service port. So I'm going to click on here, scroll down to that services section. Yep, I did. So let's click on add port. Good memory there, Sean. All righty. So the last thing we need to do is create that ingress that uh, I referred to just a few minutes ago. So I'm going to click on Add Step here and click on Kubernetes. 
and we do actually have a specific step for doing an ingress resource. So I'm going to click on add here. I'm going to leave that name the way it is because that's what it's doing. Uh, I'm going to choose our role that we created. Uh, I'm going to give our ingress a name. And then I do need to create uh, a default role. And that whenever for 80.80, go to our load balancer resource. And that's it. My entire process is done. So I'm going to click on save here. OK, so I didn't see the details. Something's not happy. So the MySQL one has a problem. Service resource. All righty, problems with live demos. Oh, I didn't give my service a name. I thought I did. Oh, there we go. Now it's happy. Okay, so we are now at a point where we can create a release and get this thing deployed. So I'm gonna create a release, click save. Deploy to developments and deploy. Alrighty. So we can see that it's already started with this. It's going to connect to our, our cluster and deploy the MySQL resource. Okay. It's saying that the deployment is complete or for the for the MySQL stuff, or it's actually waiting on it, but let's check to see what things are doing. So we're gonna go back to Rancher actually. We're gonna close this window. And Rancher, it lets you uh, within a shell actually use kubectl. And while that's loading, I'm going to make this bigger. And of course, during the actual live one, it's gonna go a little bit slower. Alrighty, so let's take a look at what pods we have. All right, so as you can see, it's already created our MySQL deployment. So let's kind of pop back over to here and see. Oh, something has failed. What failed here? Let's go take a look at what happened into the run flyway one here. So Murphy is having a field day with me today, isn't he, Mark? Can you, if you just go back to the source code there um, for a sec, it looks like the value for online 19 doesn't have the complete variable. Is that the issue? You know, that could very well be what that is. I'm going to go back to my password. Ah, ah, it looks like I didn't do a complete copy. So here we go. There we go, because it was complaining about the restart policy. But thank you for finding that. So and there it's. All right. So let's create a new release. Let's try that one more time, shall we? All the best demos of the second time around. <laughs> All right, let's see if it likes this one much better. Ah, there we go. That's better. Let's go back to Rancher and let's let's run this command one more time. All right, so we can see that it created the second pod, which is the job. 
and it's already started doing the third one for the web web application. So let's uh, working on the container creating steps right now. All right, it looks like it's running our flyway jobs. Let's take a look at what output that has. Awesome. We can see that our uh, job connected to our database using that uh, cluster IP name that we gave it. So it's like that, like I said, it's kind of like the DNS entry and it successfully ran all of our database migrations. So our database should be up and running. So I'm gonna unzoom this real quick and click close. And we can see that our application is finished deploying. So now let's go back to our Kubernetes cluster in GKE, click on services. And we can see that our web, uh, the load balancer is, it, uh, has completed executing and our ingress is still going. Ingress for, it does take a little bit to, to actually work. So if we click on that, we can see our pet clinic application is up and running as well as pulling back data. Nice. So uh, one of the other features about Rancher that we did want to show you while we're here is this cluster explorer. So within the cluster explorer, it gives you a really nice dashboard of, of what's going on in your cluster. Uh, we can see that we have two deployments that were successfully created. Uh, clicking on this will bring you to that same web page that I was at, uh, that it ran the job that we created and that completed successfully. Uh, we have three pods, uh, just all sorts of different information that you would want to know about your pod or about your cluster, not your pod. So I'm going to click refresh here to see if the ingress is done. Of course it's not. So I think at this point we might be ready for some questions. Do we have anything queued up? So one thing just before we do, I wondered if you could just um, head back to Octopus for a second, Sean. Um, Absolutely. And just if, say I didn't know my way around Octopus, I didn't know like how to find, like you were sharing, like how to get to the account or the deployment targets. I wondered if it would be a quick opportunity to talk about the global search. Oh yeah, that global search. This is actually something that's been recently introduced. Um, there used to be a search option over here and that was specifically for projects, I believe, but the global search will actually do anything. So within this search box, if I just type in pet clinic web for webinar, it will actually show me everything that it found that relates to that uh, search phrase. So uh, there's a, t uh, a target called that, there's a project called that and an account called that. So if you knew what it was named, but you didn't remember where it was, you could just simply click on or uh, type it in here and then click and it takes you directly to it. Nice. Yeah, very good. Uh, cool. Yep. So it looks like the ingress is still being created. So let's move to some questions. So today we've got Adam with us creating questions, a bit like the uh, voice of God. And so I'm hoping Adam's uh, here today to help us with that. Adam, any questions? Yes, I'm still here, Mark. Um, we do. We have a few questions. Uh, so the first one from Ashley. Where is Rancher installed, on-prem or in GCP, or does it not matter? Uh, for this demonstration, it's actually running on a compute engine in GCP. Uh, there's a way that when you define your VM inside of GCP, uh, you can tell it to run, to run a container. And that's what I've done. But apart from that, uh, Rancher doesn't have to, to run on the cloud. Uh, I've got one installed locally on my on my system here, so this is just a different one. But this is local to my to my my network. So to, the real answer to the question is it doesn't really matter as long as it has connectivity to the clusters that you want. Yeah. 
cool. Thanks for that, Sean. Uh, next question. As we've got two from uh, Rapid to here, so I'll, um, I'll ask them both together. So what if you want to run Octopus Server uh, in Kubernetes, or can you authorize implicitly with Kubernetes RBAC via a worker pod running in a cluster? That second question, can you say that one more time? I want to make sure I understand. So can you authorize implicitly with Kubernetes RBAC via a worker pod running in a cluster? That's a really good question. I've not tried that. Um, I, th yes. I think you can. You might be able to do with IAM roles with something like AWS. Um, but again, I've not tried it, so I can't say with 100% certainty th that you can. And the, that first question, one more time, was can you run... Can you run if you, can you run out, can you run octopus uh, server in, in kubernetes yes you can we do have a publicly available uh, a linux container that you can run inside a kubernetes cluster if you wanted to cool uh, we we'll probably get back to rapidly on the second question uh, and clear and clear that up yeah um cool okay uh, next question from ashley again can you export a container form uh, to yaml so if you had been using the container step and had that configured, then later you needed a feature that wasn't available in that form. Uh, yes, can you export it? Not exactly, but this form does have this edit YAML section for each of these major categories. So if you click on edit YAML, you can see roughly what it's gonna do for you. Um, so you could uh, for the different sections that, that you want, this one is specifically for the deployment, you could just copy this and start to create your own one if you wanted to. So like I said, there, that's for the deployment section. Here's one for the service. So you could start to piece together this yourself. Um, that may be a feature request we can ask if it's possible to have an export compatible or export feature. But as of right now, I don't believe it exists. Okay. Cool, oh, thanks for that, Sean. Uh, next question. Can I run Octopus as a Docker container to evaluate? Yes, you can. Uh, as I said earlier, there is a new or a publicly available Linux container. Uh, might have to search for it on Docker Hub. I don't have the link offhand, but that's definitely something that we can provide in the resources and the email later. Okay, cool. Uh, we have Last question from uh, Rafferty again. Is there a step template for direct cube CTL access from within the context of the Octopus Kubernetes account? As a partial alternative, does Octopus have the ability to apply customized changes like it does with web config files? A bit of a mouthful, that one, Sean. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I understand. So let me click on add step here real quick and Kubernetes, there is the ability to run kubectl CLI scripts. So I think yeah. that answers that that first part. Um, and say that second part one more time. So, so as a partial alternative, does Octopus have the ability to apply customized changes like it does with web.config files? I may have to ask a little bit more elaboration yeah. on that one, so I'm not yeah. entirely sure what he was going. Yeah. Yes, I'm um, probably the same. We can, we can go back on email and, and clarify that one. Cool. Uh, got a couple more questions that have just came in. We've got time to answer those. Can any user with any permissions use Octopus as a token from Rantry is used, or does the user need to have cluster level access? The, the, account, or the account is going to be the what's authenticated to the Kubernetes cluster. So if the user has the access, to use the account, then yes, they, they, they can do those types of operations. I think that answers the question, but I may not be saying that correctly. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, we kind of answered this question already, but with a bit of a different spin on this. Uh, you, you mentioned you have containers for Octopus. Can this, can this be deployed to Kubernetes in a HA configuration, i.e. many pods running Octopus pointing to one SQL server and shared file storage? That too is an excellent question. I have not tried it. Uh, I think if all containers are mounted to a shared location, it, as far as the task logs and whatnot, 
in theory, it should work. Uh, I've not tried that myself. I know in our cloud version, we don't have HA as an option yet, but I do believe they're working on that. So uh, that that is that is a, I believe so with asterisks around it because I haven't <laughs> tried it. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks for that, Sean. Okay, and I, I'll, that kind of wraps up the questions. I'll, I'll hand back over to yourselves. Cool. Thanks for that, Adam. Some very good questions there. Uh, right. So back to me. Uh, oh, actually, do you want to just go through this? So this is the ingress uh, working correctly, isn't it, Sean, first? That's correct. Uh, I was just going to quickly point out that the ingress finally got done creating, and now we're not going to port 8080 anymore. We're just going to port 80, and our application is up and functional. Excellent. Good stuff. Okie doke. So back to me. Uh, first, last thing. Uh, so as we mentioned at the start, we're recording uh, this webinar and we'll send this out in the next 24 to 48 hours. That includes some links to resources from today's session. Sean, thanks again for providing such a thorough demo of deploying to a rancher managed cluster. Second time it, it worked, first time. I really enjoyed it though. A um, couple of final things from me. Firstly, we have a free ebook called The 10 Pillars of Pragmatic Kubernetes Deployments with Octopus. That's highly worth a read and we'll share the link for that uh, on the recording follow-up email. We also have a couple of webinars coming up next month. So on the 7th of April, we've got Modern DevOps Automation with Octopus Deploy and Pulumi. And then two weeks after that, on the 21st, we've got Continuous Delivery with Octopus and Dave Farley. So hopefully we'll see you there for one of those. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sean.